I, I think the public should be worried if we didn't act. Uh, as Prime Minister, I'm standing here and saying very clearly that if we don't do anything, our ability to solve serious crimes will be radically reduced and our ability to prevent terrorist acts will be radically reduced. I'm not standing here asking for new powers and new capabilities. I'm standing here saying we need to legislate very rapidly to keep those capabilities and powers that we have. The time to debate what more we might need to do, we've agreed, is for the future. My own very strong view is that uh, we need to ask ourselves this simple question. Do we want, as a country, to leave a means of communication for paedophiles, terrorists, and other serious criminals to communicate with each other that in extremis we cannot intercept? My own view is no, we don't. Governments up to now have always taken the view, whether it's to do with the mail, whether it's to do with fixed telephony, whether it's to do with mobile phones, in extremis, to keep the country safe, there are occasions when you need to be able to intercept those communications. I believe that as technology develops, we will have over time to do more to make sure that they, we don't give paedophiles, terrorists and criminals another way of communicating that we can't in extremis uh, 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 intercept. As an old-fashioned liberal, I think it's incredibly important that people ask anyone in a position of authority about why the powers that are administered on behalf of the public are done in the way that they are, particularly when many of them are, are, are wielded in, in secret. Um, all I would say is, firstly, as, as, as the Prime Minister said, this is merely maintaining existing capabilities. But crucially, we've inserted a poison pill, if you like, into the legislation. It will fall in December 2016. We are not putting anything permanently on the statute book. What we're doing is recognising an immediate need to shore up existing capabilities. We're not pretending we have all the answers to all these complex issues in the meantime, and we're remitting, if you like, that wider debate which we will have to have and will need to be decided upon one way or another early in the next parliament. And there's a sort of, you know, there's a, there's a timetable. The next parliament, the next government, will have to decide what to do before the end of 2016 because these things will uh, lapse. In this edition of File on 4, Jenny Chris investigates what redress is available when people are subjected to unfair surveillance. Last year in the UK, more than half a million requests were made to secretly access information about people's private communications. With increasingly sophisticated technology, most people never know that they're being watched. But for those who do find out, it can be chilling. It's very easy for people to become paranoid. But certainly, for my part, I didn't use a mobile telephone for over three years. And my wife and I would only talk outside the house. We would never talk inside a house or inside an office. Over the summer, a series of headline stories revealed details of secretive computer systems that enable security agencies to access huge amounts of data, including personal emails and other information held by Internet companies. That's reignited the debate over security and an individual's right to privacy. Everybody can understand that the pace with which technology and our online activity and the government's ability to monitor us has transformed. So fundamentally, we need to review very, very carefully what framework is in place that protects the public properly. Tonight on File on 4, Secrecy and Surveillance. Who monitors the monitors? And what recourse do you have when you believe you've been wrongly put under scrutiny? Earlier this month, many of the world's top manufacturers of military hardware descended on London's Docklands. They were displaying their wares at one of the world's largest arms fairs, known in the industry as DSEI. This year's event reflected a growth in the security and intelligence gathering market, with stands exhibiting the latest in secret surveillance technology. Right, so uh, I'm fitting a battery pack into the thermal camera, and I'm going to power the thermal camera on. And uh, as the, uh, the thermal camera powers on, you'll see a thermal image on the screen behind us. Which I'm going to switch on. Michael Smith and his company Kalina are at the cutting edge when it comes to developing the latest generation of drones. 
This is one of the bigger classes of what we call civilian role UAVs. It looks a bit like a, a spider. It's what, about three foot wingspan? Yes, this is, uh, would you believe it, slightly one of the, the medium range versions. The larger versions go out to probably about six feet. And you could refer to any number of spy movies, maybe some of the 007 movies. Quite a lot of that, or some of that, does have a basis in reality. But, you know, there's, there's so much that goes on around us day to day, and certainly in the intelligence uh, arena, that's not dictated by visual cues. Radio frequencies, sounds, infrared, different spectrums that we can't see that drones with certain payloads can. Are you saying that they can pick up things other than pictures? Every drone starts with pictures, but you can also use it to, uh, and I have to use the words carefully here, slightly eavesdrop a little bit, but again, it's the people who would be doing that would be doing that under very, very strict sort of conditions. It wouldn't be people like us. It would be people who knew what they were doing, who had a specific role, who had a specific agenda, and were really sort of looking out for our best interests. Those people tasked with keeping us safe include the spies, agents and analysts of Britain's security service, MI5, and the secret intelligence service, MI6. The public's rarely told much about their operations. But this summer's leaks by CIA employee Edward Snowden about a programme called PRISM exposed how agents in the US and UK have been collecting information on a mass scale about our phone calls, emails and internet use. Former Foreign Secretary Sir Malcolm Rifkin chairs the Cross-Party Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee. He says much has changed since the Cold War and the advanced technologies now in use are vital for our protection. What we have now seen since the early part of the century is the threat is quite different. It is now from international terrorism, some of the terrorists being people who are born and living in this country, and... Therefore, you don't know who the terrorists are. You know, they could be anyone in the community. Now, that does not entitle you, in a free society, simply to look at everybody's emails. The trouble is, when you hear about cases like PRISM, the public feels that they are under surveillance and they don't know that their emails and communications aren't being intercepted or read. You have to make a distinction between what is technically possible nowadays and the way in which that technical capability is used. Just as with CCTV, in theory you could watch Mrs Snooks doing her shopping walking down the high street. The idea that the police have time or the inclination to spend their days doing that is absurd. In exactly the same way it is absurd to think GCHQ have any interest in the emails of the vast majority of people. Uh, What they're interested in are that tiny number within this huge number that may be planning some evil acts. And the technology enables one nowadays, because of these extraordinarily sophisticated computers, to separate the tiny number that may indeed be sinister from the vast majority which are of no such significance. And that vast majority are never looked at by any human being. Official statistics show that last year there were more than half a million authorizations allowing investigators access to phone, email and postal records. Another 3,300 gave them permission to actually read or listen to the content. These figures from the latest report of the Interception of Communications Commissioner both show a rise on 2011. As a retired judge, the Commissioner's job is to scrutinise the work of the intelligence and law enforcement agencies which make these applications. He's one of three Commissioners overseeing surveillance, interception and the security services. Like the Intelligence and Security Committee, they work independently from the government. But Nick Pickles from the Civil Liberties Organisation Big Brother Watch says that doesn't guarantee effective oversight. All of this scrutiny happens after the decisions have been taken to access the information. So where mistakes do arise and people's privacy is intruded upon, the Interception of Communications Commissioner doesn't prevent that. He can only take retrospective action when he learns of the errors and the mistakes being made. We can see from the report of the Interception of Communications Commissioner that he goes round, he visits GCHQ, police forces and other people to make sure that they are doing things in the right way. So surely the checks and balances are there. And this is where things start to get worrying. Take communications data. Last year there were 570,000 requests for communications data. And in previous years, this figure has hovered around the half a million mark. One figure lacking from any 
of the Interception of Communications Commissioner's reports is how many of those warrants were actually looked at to come to the conclusion that the system was working properly. We have no idea how many cases were looked at, and these operations are huge. GCHQ alone has several thousand staff, and we know across the country every day police forces are using these powers. So can it be possible for one retired judge and a very small team of staff, rarely numbering more than 10 in recent years, have any meaningful insight into what's going on? The Commissioner concedes in his report that when an agency has a large number of warrants, he can't examine them all and has to select a sample for closer observation. But he says he takes advice to ensure that the numbers reviewed are large enough to be statistically significant. We asked the Commissioner for an interview, but he declined. But Sir Malcolm Rifkin strongly defends the system, which he insists is highly robust. The Commissioner does have the power to inspect any of the warrants that have been provided to make sure that the proper safeguards have been observed. Yes, you're right, he looks at a sample of warrants, that's his decision. He can look as many as he would like to look at. Each of the commissioners, are three commissioners covering different aspects of this matter, they are people of the highest integrity, they take their job extremely seriously, and uh, if they feel they need extra resources or extra powers, they are the kind of people who wouldn't hesitate to ask for them. But their scrutiny of warrants and surveillance activity is after the event... So that doesn't really help prevent mistakes, does no, it? No, all, no, it I, all it does sorry, is no, no. all it does is yeah. find out what's happened afterwards. No, it doesn't no. allow redress. I don't follow your question in the slightest. What do you mean it doesn't allow redress? Of course it does. You can't you can't expect uh, a, a, a judge as well as the Secretary of State to be involved on the very moment that an urgent request is made. Uh, for a right to have some surveillance of a particular individual, uh, the the whole system would grind to a halt and totally collapse. What you have is uh, agencies not having the power to do this by themselves. They first of all have to get permission, they have to get a warrant. But even once they've got that warrant, the use of that warrant is then examined subsequently, retrospectively, by the commissioners. And if they find that it's been uh, used improperly, then of course there's redress. That's exactly what the system is meant to provide. The Commissioner examines the process behind the system, but if an individual thinks they've been spied on and wants redress, they have to go elsewhere. That's to a little-known judicial body called the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. The tribunal operates from somewhere here in London, but it's so secretive it doesn't publicise its address openly and wouldn't tell us where it's located. A website provides some information about its makeup and function with details of a few cases. Members of the public who suspect they've been targeted can complain to the IPT, but there's no guarantee that they'll get all their questions answered. That's because most of its deliberations are held in secret and there's rarely the opportunity to hear or challenge opposing evidence. In other words, as soon as a complaint is made about secret surveillance, the investigation of that complaint also becomes secret. There is no doubt at all that the procedure adopted by the tribunal is very far from the ordinary model of adversarial proceedings that we're all used to in courts and tribunals up and down the country. Martin Chamberlain QC is one of the barristers who represents and advises the IPT when it examines complaints brought before it, often without the complainant or even their lawyer present. That leaves him with a unique responsibility. The role that counsel to the tribunal plays in an individual case differs depending on the facts of the case. Sometimes it can be to look at material and report on it. Sometimes it can be to make the kind of submissions that the complainant would make if they could see the material. So this is a judicial hearing where the representative of one side is having to second guess what the other side might have said in order to put the case properly and fairly on their behalf. Yes, Does it make your job harder representing them when things are held in secret? Undoubtedly so, yes. You can look at the material that's deployed against you, you can try and pick holes in it, and you can hypothesise about what it is that the complainant might wish to say in response to that material. But you can never know, in the way that you could if you were able to take instructions directly from a client, what it is that that individual would want you to say about the material. Because, of course, you've never even met the complainant or even the complainant's lawyer. That's right. Is this satisfactory? It is a very different model from ordinary court proceedings. There's no doubt about that. 
and it's a good deal less fair. But the question that Parliament had to address when it set the tribunal up is whether complaints of this kind could be dealt with in any other way. This was a solution it arrived at. It decided to create a kind of inquisitorial procedure where the tribunal itself had to examine the complaint and had to reach a decision on it. The secrecy of the IPT can at least in part be put down to the highly sensitive nature of some of the cases involved. I have never even met my youngest child, who was born on the very day I arrived in Guantanamo Bay, February 14, 2002. I have missed my other three lovely children for 11 years. I have missed my wife for 11 years. I have missed my life for 11 years. An actor reads the words of Shaka Armour, the last remaining British resident to be held in Guantanamo Bay, given in an interview to BBC Radio 5 Live. He says he was in Afghanistan doing charity work when he was picked up by the authorities in 2001. He was accused of involvement with al-Qaeda and leading a fighting force against NATO, which he denies. Before being imprisoned in Guantanamo Bay, he says he was sent to Bagram Air Base, which was controlled by US soldiers. Cat Craig of the charity Reprieve, which helps prisoners around the world, has taken up his case. Shaka was forced to stay awake for nine days straight. He was denied food. Uh, his feet became frostbitten. Um, but whilst they were swollen and blackened, he was beaten on his feet. He was chained for hours in stress positions. The conditions in Bagram were horrific and clearly amounted to torture. We know that British agents were present at Bagram. We know that they engaged in interrogations at Bagram. And we know that they were actively involved in trying to both elicit information from detainees as well as being responsible for passing allegations to the Americans, which were then utilised in American interrogations. The British government has stated that it wants Shaka Armour freed and returned to the UK, but he remains in Guantanamo Bay, despite having been cleared twice for release by the US authorities. The Metropolitan Police is examining the allegations of British involvement in torture. And separately, Mr Armour has complained to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal about surveillance on himself and his family, which he believes goes back to the 1990s. Shaka has set out the details of his complaint and submitted those to the tribunal. But there is such a lack of transparency that goes against every single basic principle of British open justice. For example, the IPT isn't under an obligation to hold a hearing. If they do hold a hearing, Shaka may never even be informed of it. He may not be able to hear the evidence that is given against him. He may not even be able to respond to the evidence that is given against him. So it's by no means a given that anybody will be forced to account for their actions. And that is because the odds in the Investigatory Powers Tribunal are fundamentally stacked in favour of the government. We wanted to speak to someone from the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, but no one would be interviewed and they haven't responded to written questions about Shaka Armour's case. Sir Malcolm Rifkind argues that the secrecy in the IPT is essential when dealing with cases involving the security services. If the tribunal, which is a judge and his colleagues, if they're going to investigate, they can't do that in a public open session without destroying the whole purpose of having intelligence agencies to deal with threats to our national security. But it isn't a remedy, though, is it, for those who feel powers have been abused against them, is it? It is a remedy. No, no I, I beg to disagree with that, because it is a remedy. Uh, it comes down to a question of trust. If it was the agencies, the intelligence agencies themselves, or the government who employ these agencies, uh, who are judge and jury in their own cause, yes, that would uh, be unacceptable. That's not possible and acceptable in a free society. But if you have a judge who is not part of the government, who is somebody of uh, public uh, reputation as an independent judicial figure, of course you have to have an element of trust. I certainly w would be perfectly willing to accept that if a judge, having investigated the matter, had reached a certain conclusion on the facts which he has access to because he's vetted to see the top secret information, I would certainly trust that individual and not say because it, he can't tell me the precise details of what happened, uh, that, that, that somehow that's unacceptable. How else can you do it? There is no way you can open up all the files of MI6 or MI5 or GCHQ without the bad guys being able to read them as well. And therefore, if that's what you want, fine. 
but you then can't have uh, an intelligence agency and the battle against terrorism would be lost from day one. There is little record of the IPT upholding complaints against the security services. Nick Pickles of Big Brother Watch questions the tribunal's track record of rejecting all but a handful of complaints. The figures speak for themselves. In the decade since the tribunal was established in 2000, the first decade saw just over 1,100 complaints, and of those, 10 were upheld. But in fact, of that 10, five people were members of the same family in one case. But to put that into context, that's 10 people, 1,100 complaints, but in a landscape where more than 3 million authorizations were granted for surveillance operations. So that's a minuscule fraction, and frankly, that few errors suggest that something is too good to be true. Less than 1% of people who've complained have actually won their cases. It's probably not point several decimal places when you compare it to the number of decisions that have been made to authorise surveillance. And the real problem is that the way the IPT works, it's very difficult to bring a case if you don't have direct evidence of the surveillance going on. And of course, in most cases, people never find out that they were put under surveillance. So how can you have a system that relies on individuals complaining when individuals never find out if they are under surveillance? Jenny speaking. I'm standing outside a busy tube station in central London. It's the rush hour and like millions of people every day I've just received a call on my mobile phone. There are now concerns that even innocuous calls like this are vulnerable to interception. However this time it's not the security services who may be grabbing our data but the police using a sophisticated piece of equipment designed to help them investigate and prevent serious crime. When it's set up it can potentially monitor all mobile communications in the area. The device works by spoofing a mobile phone mast. Rather than connecting to the mast, this equipment allows your phone to connect to the the suitcase-sized device in the back of a police car and then, through that box, connect to the mobile phone mast. So the person in the middle could be collecting huge amounts of data that's flowing between your phone and the mobile phone network without you ever realising that that interception was going on. In 2011, reports emerged that suggested this kit had been bought by the Metropolitan Police to track mobile phones in a specific area or even shut them off remotely to stop them triggering a bomb. At the time, Nick Pickles was among those demanding answers about the force's apparent use of sophisticated interception technology. I have a real concern that this equipment is being used in London but yet in a manner which would collect information on potentially thousands of people's phones. And I have still yet to hear a rational legal argument for how this could be legal without having a signed ministerial warrant for interception covering every person whose devices may be compromised. I was concerned that if this device had been used in central London, perhaps near Westminster, that I could have been caught up in it that my mobile phone information could have been collected. You went to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal to try and get some idea of what was going on. What was the outcome of that? I expected the IPT to at least reassure me that there was legal authority or that they had satisfied themselves that I had not been compromised in this way. And they were able to offer neither and just simply responded by saying they felt I did not have standing to bring a claim. The problem for Nick Pickles was that he had no evidence that his mobile phone had been intercepted. And without that evidence, the IPT had no powers to investigate his complaint. That's seen as a serious flaw by critics of the tribunal system, especially in cases where mass data collection techniques are believed to have been used. We asked the Metropolitan Police to clarify their use of interception equipment, but they didn't respond. And, again, the IPT rejected our request for an interview. But there's an even more fundamental problem with the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, in that some people don't even realise it's there to make a complaint to. We'd got up as usual about half past six. And then suddenly there were large numbers of men in the front garden who'd somehow scaled a seven-foot electric gate with banging on the door. And by the time the door was opened we had upwards of 25 officers 
piling in. Middlesbrough solicitor James Watson is well known in the North East as a leading defence lawyer, representing some of Cleveland's most prolific criminals. But his own arrest early one morning in June 2009 heralded the start of a much more personal legal battle. The police were investigating allegations against him of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice by interfering with a witness during a high-profile criminal trial. Their inquiry was based on evidence amounting to little more than an anonymous letter. But during his 30 hours detention, he says it became obvious that they'd already delved deeply into his affairs. It became apparent during my first interview, from the way the questions were put, it was clear that the police were very confident that they had my whereabouts accurately pinned on certain key days. So I quickly realised that they obviously had accessed my telephone records and had accessed cell site information. Later in that first interview, they were at pains to get me to give the precise details of cars I was using at a particular time. And again, it became very apparent that they'd been using technology to track my movements in my own car. How did you feel about the fact that surveillance techniques had been used? How did it make you feel? It's curious because it was a slow-motion discovery and initially just the frightened citizen wondering whether his liberty and ability to earn money is going to be ended. What I can say is that it's very easy for people to become paranoid, but certainly for my part... I didn't use a telephone, a mobile telephone, for over three years after the incident. And my wife and I would only talk outside the house. We would never talk inside a house or inside an office. Now, whether that is an overreaction on our part or not, I don't know, and I'll probably never know. The law governing the use of interception and surveillance techniques is the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, or RIPA. All applications to use such powers have to be signed off by a senior officer to ensure the intelligence is gathered properly. But James Watson believes that used indiscriminately, Ripper can allow detectives unjustified access to further groundless lines of inquiry. In his case, he says it led to raids on his home and office, confiscation of computer files and the restriction of his wife and son to a single room while his house was searched. Under Ripper to obtain your telephone records and all sorts of other communications data, all the police have to say is that the information is necessary for them to investigate a crime. So in my case, they say we believe false testimony was given that someone tipped off a particular witness. We therefore feel it is necessary to access this communications data. In my case, you can see that the police can gain access to a treasure trove of information. Without Ripper, there would have been no reasonable suspicion to arrest me, no grounds to issue a search warrant. Armed with the information they gained from Ripper, they were able to suggest to the judge in their own words on the application for the warrant that they had a compelling web of telephone contacts underlying their suspicion. One path to take legal action would be the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. Is that something you thought about? No, I didn't, and frankly, I wasn't even aware of its existence until speaking to a producer for for this programme. But the point is this. You are highly unlikely to get any any redress in that way. They're entitled to say that everything has public interest immunity on it. There's no method of challenging it. It seems quite surprising, forgive me, but you're described as a top defence lawyer, and even you hadn't heard of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. Clearly, if I don't know about it, the likelihood is that 99% of the public won't know about it. And even if I am wrong in casting doubts on how effective it can ever be, if people don't know of its existence, it may as well not exist. What Mr Watson did decide to do was to sue Cleveland Police, and a settlement was reached in which he and his family received more than half a million pounds in damages for false imprisonment. Cleveland Police admitted that there were no reasonable grounds to suspect him of any crime. Among the findings of a subsequent report by the Independent Police Complaints Commission was criticism of the way surveillance against him had been authorised. This was on the basis that the authorising officer was too close to the person applying to conduct the surveillance. It said that her close working relationship with an applicant could be seen by some to undermine the role of the authorising officer. 
But secondly, and more importantly, it goes against all good practice advice from the surveillance commissioners. The recommendation would be that such decisions are not repeated in the future. Cleveland Police declined our request for an interview. However, in a statement they told us... The IPCC report also acknowledges the inexperience of the investigation team in using telecommunications data in evidence. The only recommendation made in respect of the Surveillance Commissioner's guidelines relates to a potential conflict regarding the line management of an individual. Assistant Chief Constable John Boucher from the Association of Chief Police Officers wouldn't comment on this particular case. But he agrees there are dangers if those signing the authorisation are too close to the inquiry team. The authorising officer should be independent of the investigation. That is made clear in the legislation. And there are some statutory guidelines that accompany the legislation. It will be, very rarely, it will be the case, particularly in smaller forces where the authorising officer, it will be unavoidable that there isn't some involvement in the investigation. We then have to make sure, and that police force has to make sure, that the Office of Surveillance Commissioners at their next inspection, which is very routinely conducted, that that's brought to their attention. That allows the oversight of the Office of Surveillance Commissioners to make sure that everybody's acting properly. The problem with the review is it's after the event. It's after the authorisation has been given and the surveillance has been carried out. It's a bit late then, isn't it? There are so many measures in place to make sure that the authority and the grounds for granting that authority and the continuation of that authority are sound. We have the Independent Police Complaints Commission. We have the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. We have the Office of Surveillance Commissioners. We have authorising officers who have to have bespoke training. Those safeguards make sure that we get it right almost all of the time. On occasions, we may not get it right. But when we don't, there are these bodies that people can go to to make sure that we're held to account. The Secret Services and the police are not the only organisations that can put you under surveillance. Even local authorities have those powers, provided they have the approval of a magistrate. We're looking at the CCTV that was taken by the local authority of our premises. Yeah, I can see a writing at the bottom saying camera one, so this is obviously from a CCTV camera. Yes, that we believe was in place for three months, but the local authority have edited it down purely to show uh, my home and a tractor going around the field. This woman knows exactly what it's like to be placed under surveillance for a prolonged period. We're going to call her Maria. It's not her real name, but she's told us she wants to remain anonymous. It was only during a planning inquiry that she and her relatives realised the family farm had been under surveillance. Members of her family were suspected of carrying out illegal disposal of waste on their land, which they deny. There was a private investigator that had been in a hide in the neighbour's field, watching our premises. Numerous photographs. They seemed to know wherever we'd been, details of it, what time we'd gone a wash of information that only family members would know about one another. What did you feel when you heard that this had been going on? I think there is a disbelief when you first see it of the the intrusion into your life. And I think the way in which they treated us is the way in which terrorists would be treated, as in, you know, it is just so serious. We have to go to these lengths. We have to sort of... Play that game. Sometime after the planning inquiry, the council sent Maria a DVD of the surveillance footage. She was concerned that the children of relatives who'd been playing in the garden might have been filmed. On top of that, she says her family found a GPS tracker device attached to one of their vehicles. Dave Holland, head of regulatory service at Cardiff Council, speaks for the local government association on law and evidence. He says councils are justified in resorting to surveillance if it's the only way to investigate suspicions of a crime being committed. And he says the process is carefully scrutinised. I can't comment immediately on this case. What I would say to you is the Local Government Association would welcome the opportunity to understand what's happened and how that could have happened and, and why it happened. 
the codes of practice within RIPA place a requirement on local authorities to make annual reports, periodic reports, to their councillors, to their elected members, on when they've used surveillance techniques, why they used them, what the purpose was for, what the outcome is for. But it's too late by then, it's happened. Yes, it's too late, it's happened. But we have to learn from that, and and local authority councillors have a role to play and challenge officers on what they do. What we need to do is make sure it doesn't happen again. In 2012, after four years of periodic surveillance, Maria complained to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal that the intrusion was disproportionate, unnecessary and potentially unlawful. She contacted the tribunal for instructions and sent them the paperwork they requested. And that was it, until she received a short reply telling her that they'd not found in her favour. Her case had been considered and decided in secret. I thought... Above all else, I thought it deserved and it warranted an open hearing. It seems to me I have to give all the details about ourselves once again, yet I'm to know nothing. And that, I think that marginalises people. I can't see that, in our case, we should have to go under the same regulations and same stipulations of secrecy to be used by the police and MI5 and MI6. Maria is now represented by Anna Mazzola of Bindman Solicitors, who has resubmitted her case to the IPT and is pushing for an open hearing. The IPT is set up as it is, supposedly so that it can ensure that government secrets are not revealed, so that the tactics of the security services and police are not undermined. This is a very different kind of case. This is about a local council and planning law, Moreover, the council accepted the surveillance took place. They disclosed the fact of it to the applicant and they're sending the monthly letters confirming it's still going on. In those circumstances, I don't see how the IPT can justify holding their whole investigation in private. It just doesn't make any sense. And that, it seems, is now a view shared by the IPT. Ten days ago, shortly after we contacted it about our programme, the tribunal decided that an initial hearing in Maria's case will take place with both sides invited to be present. Again, we would have liked to have interviewed someone from the tribunal about this case, but no one was willing to speak. It legitimately raises the question whether this court, that is largely held in secret and largely gives its rulings in secret, is properly equipped, either in theory or in practice, to deal with the increasing number of claims that ordinary people have about how their rights may have been violated by surveillance and interference with their communications. Matthew Ryder QC from Matrix Chambers has extensive experience in this field. He says it's not just the IPT but the whole legal framework governing surveillance and interception that needs to be reviewed. And he says it's time for a national debate. Privacy rights and security are always going to be in tension and the government always has to balance them against each other. Everybody can understand that the pace with which technology and our online activity and the government's ability to monitor us has transformed hugely over the last years. So fundamentally, we need to review very, very carefully whether the framework that we have in place, the legal framework, is fit for current purposes and whether we need a better understanding of how the government is engaging with us and potentially infringing our rights as well as trying to protect us, that debate needs to be transformed in order for it then to filter down into new government policy.